The Fall, Desperation and Recovery. Chapter 2, Our Move to Snail Beach, Lord's Hill Baptist Church. About that time I heard about a minister called Peter Hallihan, who was a Baptist pastor of a church in Shropshire, and he also was a representative of the Trinitarian Bible Society. He was preaching at a meeting in Dunstable, and Mr Oldham of Leicester also spoke well of him. I went to hear him preach, and shortly afterwards we decided to visit him in Shropshire to outline our position, as we'd withdrawn from the Beerton Church and were out of church fellowship. It was soon evident to me that if the church where Peter Hanahan was the pastor was in Beerton, I would feel it right to join the Lord's Hill Church. But we lived in Beerton, and this church was in Snail Beach, Shropshire. My wife and I both felt persuaded that we should move house, and I should change my job, if it was the Lord's will, that we should join that church. I felt that if God was directing us this way, I must make the moves, and the way would be opened up to us. We advertised a house for £97,500, but dropped the price to 92000 in order to sell. We were able to buy a three-bedroom house bungalow for £37,000 cash in Snailbit, Shropshire. We moved in January 1986 and joined the church shortly afterwards. We were both very hopeful, expectant and looking to God for support. I still worked at Luton and travelled there each Monday morning and returned to Snailbit at the weekend. It was a two and a half hour drive each way. I stayed at Stephen Royce's home and his family during a week and travelled home at weekends. I had hopes to obtain a lecturing job in one of the colleges in Shropshire. Now whilst waiting to get a job in Shropshire in February 1985, I was asked to join the trade union movement at Luton College called NAPFI. I had not joined as a matter of principle, which I had the opportunity to explain in these letters. And here is the letter asking me to join. The significance of this letter will become apparent when I write about my forced resignation under threat of dismissal at Luton College in 1988. I write about this letter. It was a trade union NAPFI who acted, acted in the interest of the union in negotiating my terms of resignation. This forced resignation was the result of my first medically diagnosed hypermanic episode. But at that time, I felt it was simply due to my excessive work and the op opposition that I experienced at Luton College in seeking to develop a training centre for satellite television reception. Here's a letter. Dear David, as the membership secretary of NAPFI, I am writing to you to suggest that you might consider joining the union. At present, education is under attack as the part of the public sector of the economy. And although it is true that as lecturers we have special interest in being opposed to reductions in educational provision, we can make also a case against these particular reductions in expenditure on more altruistic and objective grounds. However, although NAPFI is involved in a great many ways in attempting to be a positive influence in education, I would be misleading you if I did not say that our trade union functions are fundamental to our existence. For the immediate future, these trade union functions are going to include defending jobs and conditions under which we teach, and as a spin-off, the quality of courses that we offer not to be underestimated. In any attempt to increase student-staff ratios, this is always at risk, even if not a certainty that working conditions can degenerate and become a breach of agreements between the local education authority, their really employer, remember, not the college, and NAPFI. We must be prepared to resist such moves where possible. Our policy must be to preserve the quality of courses and the work that we do. Naive and simplistic assumptions that raising staff-student ratios equals more efficiency needs serious questioning. It smacks of never mind the quality, 
feel the whip. The way in which efficiency is defined requires questioning. If compulsory redundancy is proposed for any member of NAPFI, our policy is to defend that member of the union. Of course, if a non-NAPFI member of the staff is threatened with redundancy, we cannot be enthusiastic about defending that person on a personal basis unless it has repercussions for our own members. Indeed, if there is any suggestion that a NAPFI member is to be compulsory redundant, we would have to insist that the local education human sacrifice would have to be drawn from the list of non NAPFI lecturers. Any union has to take the position of hands off our members. It is its job to do this. But not only do you have to think of self-preservation, but also of your colleagues' positions. Will you be able to oppose a bad policy when directed against other people and act in what you might consider a fair, reasonable way, simply by standing alone? That I leave to you. For some staff, the way in which the union works is not totally understood and we intend in the near future to issue explanatory notes to make this clear to members. We know that communication could be improved. I hope that you will now seriously consider joining our ranks and push the proportion of membership about the existing photo of 91% of full-time staff. Yours fraternally, Roy Bride. Here is my reply on the 5th of the 2nd, 85. Dear Roy, re Natfi, thank you for your letter in response to me joining the Natfi Union. I can see and understand your points of concern. However, I am not a member of the uni because of a matter of principle. I fear God and am a Christian. If I were a member, I would, as a matter of conviction, be obliged to contend against all actions which are opposed to Christ and morality. This is not my calling as a lecturer. My protection in respect to my work is by the hand of the living God. I know also if my colleagues were that concerned they too might seek divine protection through Christ Jesus, as I do myself. It is he that watches over me, and if, according to his command, I lose my job, then who am I to resist the living God? If you like, I could speak on this subject to all the members of at national and local union level. I would also be prepared to debate or answer criticism of those that feel the need to do so. Yours sincerely, David Clark. I was quite surprised to receive further correspondence on the same subject, and it made interesting reading. Dear David, 5th of the 3rd, 85. I thank you for extending the courtesy of a reply to my note to you. I understand the position you take in your letter. Of course, in the end, it has to be a matter of personal conviction which would decide the matter of union membership, and for you this is a stronger factor than for others. What I do not wish to do is, of course, create a clash of loyalties and principles for anyone with genuine misgivings. In the end, it would have to be your decision. So anything that I write here is done knowing that fact. Not knowing the exact religious sect to which you belong, I am at some disadvantage in the question, which I would pose to you, that might not seem to be addressing themselves to the points which, to you, are most crucial. However, I gather that your concept and notion of predestination by saying that if you lose your job, that will be according to his command. Please explain to me why the act of joining a union might not be counted as being determined by the living God, for how can one event be regarded differently from that of another in this way? This might be particularly relevant if the job loss results from the central government policy inspired by monetarism, a creed that the market of capital should dominate the lives of people. Did not Jesus have something to say about the money exchanges of the temple? Is it a negation of God's work to be opposed to the evil of the destruction educational opportunity for people? Why is that a struggle against power that wish to make worse the lives of people is seen in some way as not carrying out God's work, whereas the actions of those Damaging education is seen to be an act of God. Although as a child, I was christened as a Congregationalist. 
I became one who rejected the idea of God because fearing God did not make sense. To do something because I feared the consequence of, of not seemed to be abandoning one's human responsibility. Imagine the mass murderers of the Nazi regime claiming that they were carrying out God's work. Of course, this is an extreme case, but it raises the point in an extreme way that personal judgments need to be exercised in some cases and the act of exercising that judgment might be fulfilling God's intention. Surely there can be an active interpretation of predetermination as well as a passive one. Anyway, if you resolve to maintain your position, then it is your decision. At least I felt that your letter deserves some reply. Your sincerely, Roy Bride. P.S. One member of staff has decided to pay equivalent to the annual subscription to the teacher's benevolent fund instead of joining. My reply to the secretary. I felt it right to reply to Roy and give further answers to his questions, as clearly he was not saved and had by his own admission turned away from God. I felt it an ideal opportunity to speak of God's sovereignty and love in Jesus Christ. Here is my reply. Dear Roy, our correspondence in respect of NAPFI membership. Thank you for your reply on the 5th of February. I am most intrigued by your response and am pleased you have given me the consideration to have my views even though I think you may think me a little naive. Without wishing to be too personal or cause offence directly, may I take the liberty to answer some of your points. It may possibly be the means of enlightenment to you in light of divine predestination and man's responsibility. Yes, I do believe absolutely in divine predestination as you put it. If by that you mean the end of all things is determined, therefore the means to the end are also determined. I would confess to belief in the scripture which states that God has determined all things and all things come to pass according to his predetermined purpose. That our being made or created is for God's own glory and pleasure. Acts 2 verse 23 and Revelation 4 verse 11. That God has chosen some of the human race to obtain salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and left others to answer divine justice for their sins. Ephesians 1 verses 4 5, Jude 1 verse 4 and Romans 9 verse 14 to 20. In all this the glory of God is great for we have a display of the everlasting love of God the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. A love which is unchangeable and sovereign in its bestowment. God loving some and not all, contrary to popular opinion. Romans 9 verse 13 to 16. The reason for this love has nothing to do with what is found in the sinner. For this choice is without respect to actions done or capable of being done. In fact, the choice was before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter to verse 2 and Ephesians 1 verse 4. If it were based upon merit, none could be saved. Therefore, it is a choice through grace alone, not based upon works. This salvation is received by faith and not through or deeds of merit. Romans 4 16. With respect to the chosen, all things work together for their good. That industrial strife, famine, unemployment, sickness, death, in, in fact all evil works together for their eternal good. That these things are sent to God, to us, that we might learn not to rest in ourselves, but rather cause us to seek our all in him and depend entirely upon that which he has promised us in his own divine word. Romans 8.35 In respect of our responsibilities, I agree with you, we are responsible to do those things which are right and sensible for our own preservation. If needs be, we oppose evils and fight for those things, which are right and proper, not only for ourselves, but for the coming generation, but all in the bounds of, if possible, live at peace with all men. I do not, however, by this mean, we should be stupid and allow all, as you rightly point out and refer to the Nazi oppression, to vanquish all that is opposed to idealism. In fact, any such system whether it be communism, socialism, capitalism or any other isms should be resisted if it adopts those flaws common to corrupt human nature. I therefore say to you, 
since you appeal to scripture as the basis to oppose monetarism and claim educational opportunity that this is a work of God, then use the whole scripture to govern your policies, and by that means I might be inclined to help. I would suggest the following, and give this to you for consideration. 1. Never engage in a fight unless it is a righteous cause. God is on the side of the righteous. 2. That the battle be one you think you can win, in which case God might be sought in prayer and divine aid be asked for. 3. Consider whether God has called you to fight the battle, in which case there will be principles taught clearly in the scripture. 4. Consider whether the men you fight with are reliable and moved by the same principles of convictions. A divided army or kingdom is not likely to win any battle. 5. Fight with all your might, for the righteous will hold on his way. I am fully aware of the Nazi regime and also the connection with the Roman Catholic Church. Also, that the basis of the Third Reich was upon Jesuitical principles. See The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. Not only so, but Hitler and Mussolini were both sons of the Catholic Church, and so the scriptures fulfilled in that the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all the slain upon the earth was found in her, the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 70 to 18 verse 24. My question to you is, do you think your contention with monetarism is a holy war. I believe a holy war is directed against any that oppose Christ in his church. Not one ism against monetarism, as you call it. I tell you, if I believed this policy of government was opposed to Christ in this matter of educational cuts, that according to my five-point plan, I would be engaged in the battle. That if I found none with me, I would fight alone, just as David fought Goliath and like Samson who slew a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. But I would not fight or join with hands with apostates, atheists, unbelievers or heretics, for they would be in the way and could not wield the weapons of truth. You suggest that it might be according to the will of God and purpose of God to join the union to fulfil his purpose, to which I answer, he would direct me to do so. And I would know that calling in the same way as I know my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that I am saved my sins be forgive me, and I have divine protection. This knowledge I would derive from the scriptures of truth, as I employ my reason in biblical principles, and walk according to the faith once delivered unto the saints. Read your tentative inquiry to what sect of Christendom I belong. Maybe you might review your knowledge of the sects and find a place for me. I would certainly be interested to see in what group I am pigeonholed. Yours sincerely, David Clark, 14th of the sec, 85. Recollection and Union Views Now It is only now, as a result of this account, when I look back on these things, that I am beginning to learn some of the lessons I had believed in my head, but not proved by actual experience of knowing God in the very depths of one's soul's agony and experience. I now believe the net for Union are a valuable functioning body and have no problem in supporting and being a member of such a union. This is because they have thrashed out with management their rules of conduct, which, if employed, can result in very fair dealings with members. I think union services should be offered free to non-members. This, I think, would enlist more members. It was shortly after this that my agony began and I really began to feel the effects of my depression. I never did get work in Shropshire, and it never happened. I had attended three interviews in three colleges, but failed to get any job. I wondered what God was doing. That year I missed out on my first promotion at work at Luton because they understood I was intending to move away. This knowledge all added to the aggravation I later began to feel. During this time I experienced awful agonies and fear and doubts, etc. I began to believe I was like King Saul in the Old Testament and the Lord had rejected me. I began to think that all my experience of God was of the flesh and not of God. I felt what I thought an apostate would feel and that just added to my agony. I felt alone, isolated, very depressed. Depression set in 
and Stephen Voice began to call me Mephibosheth, as he was the son of King Saul who had gone to live in Lodibar. Where I looked back, that was a very good description of my situation and position. I had never heard of that term manic depression or bipolar mood swings, but on reflection, and after being clinically diagnosed with manic depression, I realised this experience was part and parcel of my mental condition at that time. My wife also became very depressed and suffered all kinds of agonies. On a number of occasions she would ring me at work, crying about the difficulties she faced. Eyes that was being bullied severely and she couldn't cope. She felt hostility from some of the church and did not know how to manage. It all too became too much. I stayed at the Royces for a period of eight months during the week which whilst I worked at Luton College and travelled home to Shropshire at weekends. I hated the journey and very often on the way back to work on a Monday morning I would have to stop and seek God for strength to continue. I was feeling so ill through depression. I began to feel that I had been cast away by God and was in a similar position as King Saul in the Old Testament having begun well, but was later rejected by God. I felt as I thought an apostate would feel, which in turn cast me down even further. I wanted to die. End of chapter 2